Well, we're here today in Abingdon, home to the MG Car Club and of course the former site of the uh, MG Car Company building the likes of the MGB. It's 55 years uh, since the MGB GT was introduced in 1965 uh, and that was really sort of the defining era for sports coupes. Throughout the 60s and 70s, while sports cars were de rigueur, come the 80s, we'd kind of fallen out of love with the coupe and the convertible and we turned our love affair into hot hatches. But come the end of the 80s, with insurance premiums killing off hot hatchback ownership for so many, our love affair was reignited for coupes. So we've assembled four modern sports coupes, um, and not for the first time, the Japanese really started uh, the new trend for modern coupes with a regular hatchback derived sports coupe. So we've brought together the Honda CRX from the late 80s, we've got the uh, Fiat Tipo derived Alpha GTV, we've got my Mark IV Golf derived Audi TT, and we've got the Ford Fiesta derived Ford Puma. So we're going to take these out for a drive around the lovely leafy lanes of Oxfordshire and Berkshire. Um, obviously I can't drive all four of these cars myself as much as I'd like to, so uh, I've seconded some of the very best of the Classics World team to come along for the drive. Just uh, waiting for everybody now. I'll bet there'll be some more faffing yet. So today I'm in our Honda CRX, which in many ways is the odd one out. Not only is it much older than the other three, but it was also a much more basic, smaller car. It's based on the Civic, but it does feel that much smaller than the Civic. It really is a little roller skate of a thing in a very good way. There's another quite important way in which it differs from the other cars here. It's worth many times more than all of these other cars. They're all 1,000 quid, 1,500 quid cars. This CRX, I bought it at auction about a year ago for the company. With fees, it cost us about six grand and it's probably worth more now. I found myself just popping out to the shops, taking the CRX instead of my everyday automatic Toyota or even my own Alpha Spider. I came back to the car the other day, picking my daughter up, she's 12. Instead of saying, oh, what's that old banger, Dad? She said, oh, cool, can we listen to New Order again? Gotta love the 80s. It's a great driver's car, the CRX. It's thrashy and revvy and low and bumpy, and it handles nicely. It's poised and direct, but it's uh, quite safe as well. It's front wheel drive, you're not gonna get into any trouble. And it does go well. The thing is, it's a driver's car on a country lane or a B road, a nice sunny afternoon, a quick thrash to the shops and back. It's not one for a long motorway trip. It really does your head in. I was on the M6 the other night for two hours. Oh dear, I kept looking at my watch thinking, when are we gonna be there? Against the other three cars, the CRX is absolutely dwarfed, even by the Puma. But it's amazingly practical. The rear seats may be so small that Honda haven't even bothered trimming them properly. They're just a sort of apologetic plastic bench. The other day, I got my bicycle in the back, five boxes of books and a bucket. And it all fitted and the boot shut. So it's as practical as a Golf. A polo, certainly. You'd expect us to be pretty good at predicting future price trends of classic cars, modern classics that are worth investing in. I would say don't listen to me, because who could have predicted back in, say, the mid-90s, that the Honda CRX would be worth so much more than the Puma, the Alpha GTV, or the Audi? Just goes to show the unpredictability of the modern classic market. This wasn't the fast-flowing, open country drive I'd been expecting. I was going to say, will we do, are we doing a tour of Oxfordshire's building site? So here I am in my 2003 Audi TT 1.8 turbo quattro 180 horsepower. It's quite a mouthful, isn't it? I know. The Audi was a concept car in the mid 90s and actually didn't come out until 1999. But very much like the uh, Alpha GTV and the Ford Puma, they were probably made economically possible by being based on a fairly standard family hatchback that was already in the Mark's offerings. 
So obviously in the case of the Audi TT, it had the Mark IV Golf as its platform. So it meant the bodywork and the interior could be as pretty and as stylish as you wanted to, because all the basic mechanicals underneath it were standard fare being produced hundreds of thousands of times over every year in Mark IV Golfs and Sayout Leons and Skoda Octavias and stuff like that. It also means that getting parts and everything else is really easy with these things. It's refined, it's the steering's well weighted, the gears change is just delightful. All the pedals and controls are close to hand. It just feels like a car that you could go a very long journey in and not feel it at all. The other point to make about the Audi TT compared to the other cars on this group is that they're still really readily available. Obviously they made it for quite a long time in over three generations, but when I searched for each of these cars online, I found a grand total of 10 Alpha GTVs for sale. I think there are 11 Ford Pumas and 174 of these. It's a shame that cars like the Alpha and the Ford Puma have faded into obscurity. They've just not lasted, they've rusted away. They're just a more unusual choice, you know, whereas the Audi's a bit more ubiquitous. Maybe that makes it more boring as a result. What it does mean, of course, is that there are, as I say, loads of parts available for it, loads of specialists that are willing to service and maintain these cars. Again, it's probably not as exciting as the Ford Puma, nor as the, the Alpha GTV, or perhaps as visceral as the Z CRX, but as an all-rounder, I think the Audi TT is hard to beat. It's fair to say that I wouldn't be unhappy to have any of our quartet of coupes on the driveway at home. I went looking for a TT before I ended up with this Puma. The CRX is a bit of a hero car, especially in VTEC guys, but I'd be quite happy with a D-Series version as well. And uh, the Alpha, well, everyone needs to own an Alpha. On paper, the Puma is probably the least impressive of the four. It's based on a Mark IV Fiesta, which, although a decent enough car, is quite unremarkable, really. The values are the lowest, for a good one anyway. And of course, you've got the Puma issue of rusting. So it doesn't really stack up all that well until you get behind the wheel. I have been so pleasantly surprised by what this Puma offers. This is the 1.7 version, so it's got the uh, ZTEC SE that's had even more work from Yamaha. It's a great little engine. It's not the quickest 0 to 60, but the short gear ratios make it an absolute joy on country lanes and up hills and just throwing it about. And the gearbox change itself is so precise. It's just an absolute pleasure to drive. I have used this Puma for everything. Going to the shops, going to work, just whipping around everywhere. And I've loved every minute of it. It's been a pleasure. At the thousand pound price point we paid for this particular Puma, I got a two owner car with fewer than 70,000 miles on the clock. Now for the same sort of money, you could buy yourself a TT, but it's probably going to have done 150,000, 160,000. And the Alpha GTV in this company has done 130,000. You get a lot of car for your money. It's probably wise to budget some of that money on rust proofing, but uh, it's a Fiesta under the skin, so most things are available. And because a lot of them are rusted away, sadly, that does mean that secondhand parts are still quite easy to come by. It has the least powerful engine, but it's certainly not the heaviest in this company. And I defy the three chaps in the other cars to have as much fun as I'm gonna have in this one. I don't know, it just makes me smile. You'll have to excuse me, sort of, my broken chat because uh, I'm on a sweeping B road and uh, that's where the Puma loves to be. It's a Fiesta, but not as we know it. In many ways, it's kind of hard to justify the Alpha GTV in this company. If you want something that's raw and hardcore and fizzy and something you can take out on a B road on a Saturday morning, peg on the limiter and then put back in the garage when you're done, you want the Puma or the CRX. If you want something that's a usable daily driver that's a bit more interesting than a Golf is, but you can still put people in it, you can still put some luggage in it, you can still get reasonable MPG out of it, you want the Audi. So where does that leave the GTV then? The thing is, it's not a raw, raucous B-road bashing machine like the Ford and the Honda are because it's too heavy, it's not eager enough down low, and it just doesn't feel quite as sharp as either of those cars do. 
but it's also nowhere near as good of a daily driver proposition as the Audi. You definitely can't get people in those back seats, you can't fold the back seats down so you can't really get anything of any length in the boot, and because of the shape of the boot, i.e. very deep but also not very long, you can't really put a decent load of shopping in there either. What's more, in town the visibility is not brilliant. The MPG is pretty appalling at town speeds. I was working out around about 20 MPG from this two litre, and if truth be told, it doesn't actually ride that well for what is allegedly a Grand Tourer. In short, there's no rational or reasonable or measurable reason for buying the Alpha GTV. And yet, as we roll onto these fantastic roads flowing through some of the best that Southern England has to offer, suddenly it all makes sense. This car flows so nicely, the steering is really nice and sharp on the turn in, and because it's not too firmly sprung, it flows through these longer sweeping corners, and let's not forget, whereas the Honda and the Ford Badger, fairly humdrum, not really anything special, and the Audi badge comes with a whiff of pretense about it, this is an Alfa Romeo. From the minute you get in this car, it makes you feel special. Not just that gorgeous bit of design outside, but when you get inside, you sit in this lovely black Momo leather, you've got these nice switches, you've got these silvery dial bezels, you start it up and that twin spark engine fizzes into life and gives a nice zing, particularly with the exhaust on this car. This car makes you feel special, and that ultimately is what coupes are all about. Sadly, the weather then turned a bit less special, dashing our hopes of a picturesque finish. We therefore retreated somewhere drier, but a bit less pretty. So here we are at the end of the trip. We've had a good drive round some Oxfordshire and Berkshire roads. We've ended up in uh, not so sunny Newbury. So what do we think, chaps? I think we were promised a better ending to the trip than this, to be honest, but... Um, Slightly more somewhere. glamorous surroundings, <laughs> maybe. But... Than a multi-storey car park. The, the finish line might not have been the highlight, but I think the cars are. I think they've all, they've all in their own ways, been very impressive. Yeah. Well, yeah. We've brought four very different cars. We've got to decide which one we like the best. Well, the funny thing is that everybody you speak to and everybody that we've driven past today has immediately taken the CRX as their first point of interest. And everybody loves it, and it's worth, what, six, seven times more than the others. But if I had to choose a car to go home in, or to drive a really long way, I'm going home in this as it happens actually, if I had to choose a car to drive a really long trip in, it wouldn't be this one because it's so uncompromising, it's so noisy and rough. And I'm, I really like the Puma actually, um, probably just nostalgia reasons. I remember going on the press launch all those years ago and being amazed by how good they were. I've had the Alfa and I'd like that. The, the Audi's just so good, it could almost be a, a modern car. They were that yeah, ahead of the game really. True. So uh, the Puma for me, I think. I love the CRX, I'm a huge fan of it. And if I had to own one, out of all these, probably purely from a financial point of view, that's the one I want on my drive. It's cracking fun, but it's relegated these days to the role of a hobby car. It's also showing potentially where these other three will end up, because this is now super rare. Properly collectible. Properly collectible, really desirable. And these three, I think, are all on that same trajectory, albeit five, ten years down the line. Yeah. I'm going to be completely upfront here. You and I brought our own cars to this, and I brought this thinking, you know what, I'm going to fall in love with this properly on this trip and I'm going to come away thinking, yep, that's the right car for the job and it's an unsung hero. But honestly, it's not as comfortable long distance as that would be, but it's not as fun on the twisty bits as that would be. For me, it's very, very tight between TT and the Puma. And I know the Puma is the car I've been driving around and the car, <laughs> car I've bonded with. And if I wanted the spirit of the CRX, in a much cheaper package, with, with a better ride, it has to be said, with better equipment. There it is, the Puma. CRX is in a class of its own as far as I'm concerned. It's a completely different driving experience. I've always struggled with Alphas of any era, actually, and I know that's heresy to so many Italian car fans, and I'll probably get lynched Blasphemous. the next time I go to Brooklands Blasphemy. or something like that, but I would always worry about it breaking and whether I could get another part for it or whatever. Obviously, if I couldn't take the Audi home, because that's the one I am taking home, the one I would take home is the Puma. They've just got the concept so right. I think the, the suspension has been so well tuned from that Richard Parry Jones era of Ford, where they just got the rider handling spot on. And as you say, it's still relatively affordable, which is, which is great, you know. Obviously the TT ticks a lot of boxes for me, but I think this one would be the one you'd 
take for that Sunday drive down the down the B road. I'm going to make an admission to you here. <laughs> from the, from the very minute you drove this in the gate, I've wanted to go in this. And truth be told, watching you zip around in this, I think it it looks wicked when it's going. They're still cheap to buy. I think they've aged really well. I'm not a Ford man particularly, but um, it sounds to me like the Puma is the choice. I think wow. the Ford Puma so takes it. Wrestle Jeff for the keys. I'm going to take my CRX home and park it up in the garage next to my Alpha. Well, I'm delighted by that verdict, obviously. I've championed this car for some time and it will make me feel better now when we have to spend money fixing all the rust. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> there we go.